Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you, Stacy and I. Enjoyed our two hour drive over from the closer to the Gulf. The place where we live. Stacy didn't get her to introduce. I'll say a couple things about myself, but uh, my wife of uh, about 1,350 days. <laughs> 45 months almost. The reason we've only been married a short time is because we had a really long courtship. 26 days. <laughs> From the time we met till we got married. God is good when He says go, you go. Amen. Amen. Just like humongous house. <laughs> is that a clock back there on the wall? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay. I'm supposed to see that, then I'm in good shape. We're going to have 1230. You're going to have 1230? Maybe not today, sister. No. <laughs> <laughs> supports my iconoclastic or my kind of off the wall sometimes <clears throat> position. I don't enjoy being iconoclastic or different for the sake of being different. I enjoy being different for the sake of being right. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I'll just get a feel from the audience here. I have to be careful. <clears throat> I don't like the term happy sad. Regardless of what the circumstances are, Sabbath peace. Because our God is a God of peace. Praise His name. <clears throat> today, I, today I wish to take a brief, I wish this were in a series, but it's not. Look at the good news of Christ in contrast to the fake news of His day. The fake news that He came to expose, if you please. Last week, Stacy and I were visiting relatives in Virginia. Second grandbaby, her side. Not, nothing on my side yet, but it's our side. And we had the privilege, the opportunity to visit Mount Vernon, the home of George and Martha Washington. It was my first visit, our first visit, and we were impressed with all that we saw and learned. Even though, and this is my iconoclastic side coming out a little bit here, even though there was subtle undermining of the wonderful good that John George Washington had done. Well, you'd almost think these days you have to have per perfection before you can be appreciated and honored. Does that ever bother you, what I just said? The escalating attacks this is going to be biblical, so hang on, hang on with me. But the track of the Bible, the track of biblical history, and the track of our history, what's happening today, run pretty close together, don't they, Raymond? Yes, they do. They're not separated. There's too many people are sitting around waiting for some Sunday law. But if you're waiting for the Sunday law without knowing what's going on today, you're going to be misled. Right. Founders like Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Mason, I could go on. All flawed human beings. And God used it. I believe this attack that we're witnessing these days is nothing but a backhanded attack on Scripture. Amen. Nothing but a backhanded attack on Scripture. What are you talking about, Dale? Moses was a murderer. 
wrote the first five books of the Bible. Jesus called him the greatest prophet. Didn't he? Yeah. Did I get that right? Abraham was a liar. His son Isaac had his bad days too. Jacob, his son, Isaac's son, was a world-class deceiver. God even had to change his name when he gained the victory through Christ to Israel. Overcomer. Matthew was undoubtedly a tax thief. They all were in those days, those tax collectors. Still are, I guess. <laughs> I have a good friend that's tax collector, so I have to be careful. Peter, James, and John could cuss with the bust of them. And half the New Testament was written by a man who kidnapped and had Christians killed. Okay, we're going to throw all that out? To hear some people talk about it. If you're not perfect. So the issue is not about perfection. The issue is about revisionism. Just like history is being revised, revised so is Scripture being revised. <clears throat> You know, I've learned a few things through my 72 years. Two <clears throat> times that I regret deeply that there's a beautiful experience that every one of the Bible writers experienced and every true believer experiences right now. It's called repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Is it any more beautiful than that? Repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation. <clears throat> if, we can, if we can't acknowledge with Paul that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst, then I question whether or not we're Christian. Father in heaven, <clears throat> who is worthy to stand in this pulpit? I'm sure. We will be in with Jesus forever. <clears throat> Not because of our worth, but because of His. Amen. Like we just sang, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. May His presence guide this brief study, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> One of my favorite stories from the Revolutionary War, and I do love history, those of you who haven't figured that out. And one of the first things you learn about history is how dumb we are because we're always repeating it. <laughs> My mother used to say that if you have to be told over and over and over again that uh, there's a switch waiting for you outside. <laughs> right? Well, that's kind of what we've done with history. One of my favorite stories from the Revolutionary War, of course, involved George Washington, who I rank in the top three, if not the top. There was a leader, those of you who know Pennsylvania, I haven't met somebody I met earlier today said they were from Pennsylvania. You know where Ephrata is, don't you? Because I used to live in Reading before that state college. <coughs> Ephrata down in the southeast corner of Pennsylvania, and there was a Baptist community. <coughs> I didn't know this coming. There was a Baptist com community in which the leader was a man by the name of Peter Miller. Peter, Peter Miller was a godly man and was really, and his very godliness undoubtedly provoked the troublemaker of that town to oppose him every time he turned around. You know, like Paul wrote to Timothy, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. persecution. This guy was always spreading dissension, lies. These days we might call fake news. Finally, the man was accused of treason and convicted. Now, in those days, the, the, the sentence for treason was punishable with hanging. It was not any long, drawn-out appeal process. Convicted? We schedule your hanging pretty quick. No sooner had the death sentence been pronounced that Peter, Peter Miller took off to see General Washington, who was in Philadelphia. It was a 60-mile walk from Philadelphia. His purpose of going was to intercede for this man's life. 
General Washington re responded to Peter Miller and says, I'm sorry, sir, I cannot pardon your friend. The man said, friend? He was no friend of mine. I don't have an enemy worse than him. And the incredulous George Washington said, you've walked all this way to intercede on behalf of your enemy? Peter Miller said, yes, sir. I grant the pardon. Peter Miller had 15 more miles to go because this man who is unnamed according to the history I've seen was scheduled to be hung that very afternoon and Peter Miller arrived just as they were leading him up to the gallows and the man was quoted as saying, here comes old Peter Miller. He walked all this way just to watch me hang. Does a text from Romans ring in your ears? Romans 5, 10. For if when we were what? Enemies. Enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. That's some good news. Amen. Not will be reconciled when you believe, but we were reconciled 2,000 years ago. Your belief merely confirms a historical reality. Amen. That's the good news that's still languishing. We're so focused on ourselves, we forget the focus of the very Christian gospel and the very Christian life is Christ, our righteousness. Amen. Amen. Not my response, but His response to me being His enemy. My response just comes out of a heart of gratitude of what it cost Him to say. The so pardon is all of grace. Undeserved favor. Our response from the heart is faith. Ask yourselves as you study Romans this quarter, and that's my favorite letter. I taught it in every church I ever passed through. Sometimes up to two years. Not, not 12, 13 hours. Two years just to get through the book of Romans. Ask yourselves as you study Romans this quarter is the core teaching, what's this? Is the core teaching of Romans justification by faith or is it justification by grace through faith? There's a huge difference in emphasis there. Amen. It's crucial, it's absolutely crucial. Because grace is God's righteousness. My faith is the response to that righteousness. So my, if, if it weren't for His righteousness, His grace, then what difference would my faith make? None. The emphasis is crucial. Because it takes the... i got a huge ego. He asked my wife. That's why grace is so important to me because it takes... It takes the, it takes the focus off of Dale and puts it on Jesus. So many years after the Revolutionary War, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation freeing four, roughly four million slaves. Washington put it in his will that all of his slaves would be all 300 or so. Actually, about 150 were his, and another 150 were belonged to neighbors. That they would all be free. It's too bad he didn't do it before he died. But keep in mind, these men were on a trajectory. Amen. They were on a trajectory. Amen. They didn't go, you can't go from zero to a hundred overnight, you, but they were on a trajectory. And that's what breaks my heart when I see that trajectory being mocked these days. It's sad. It's sick and it's sad. Amen. For every six slaves free. In Lincoln's War, one soldier died. That's a high cost. A one to six ratio. Some 40 years later, roughly 40 years later, a little lady by the name of Ellen Moore, you know her? Penned these words, Ministry of Healing, page 90, with his own blood, you know, with his own blood, 
Christ signed the emancipation papers of the race. Not when they believed, but when he died. That's grace. That's the emphasis. The good news. That's grace. That's grace. And when we see that, when we truly see it, it breaks our heart. In a broken heart, God is not despised. For some 125 years, do the man. This good news of God's grace continues to be all too often sidelined. Watered down with the emphasis on man's response rather than the biblical emphasis of God's free gift. Amen. Fake news is still winning the day in the church. But God promises through the words of Jesus and the New Testament writers that the good news will prevail. Amen. Revelation 18 says so. Amen. And the fourth angel will lighten the world with the good news of Christ our righteousness. Amen. Let us examine briefly. I can't see that clock. Oh, that will be the thing to do. Right, brother. We're good. I do like to respect it partially. <laughs> Let us examine briefly the final hours. And as I said, this should be a, 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 a series. But the final hours of our Lord, Savior, and Lord before He was taken to the cross itself. The trial of Jesus illustrates as vividly as I've ever been to imagine, the clash between good news and fake news. It's enormous, the contrast. And the vast majority of the people bought the fake news. I contend that it was not so much the person of Jesus that was on trial, but it was God Himself and His way of saving mankind that was on trial. Yes. At the initiation of the Lord's Supper, just short time before, Jesus had proclaimed in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and what else? The life. life. He was thereby proclaiming Himself to be the gospel. Amen. It's interesting that after this, that this was said after Judas had left the room. And I wondered, why? Why didn't Jesus say that to Judas? Of course, he said things like that all, all of his ministry, but he waited. Judas has left the room. Because Jesus is on the verge of the great test that was come upon his disciples and upon himself. Jesus apparently does not share the really big insights with those who are in a state of resistance. What's this? This is one reason why we're still here. The Lord should have come long ago. Amen. Do you know the servant of the Lord said that how many times? Twenty? Roughly? Yes. The Lord could have come here at this, but I'm not. Be careful with this. Well, I'm sure glad I got born. Is that a word? I got birth. Really? When is our selfishness going to be over? Jesus deserves to come. I don't deserve to go, but He deserves to come. Amen. Oh, Lord have mercy. That's why we're still here. We know that from putting the various chronological pieces together that Jesus was first taken to Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest that year who was Caiaphas. And as obviously being the older of the two, was determined that this son-in-law is, you know how sometimes daddy, and how somehow father-in-laws and son-in-laws sometimes clash? <laughs> he was determined that his son-in-law was not going to botch this job. Surely Caiaphas was haughty, and surely it was Caiaphas who said, who had said that it was expedient for one man to die and the nation of Israel to be saved. For you see, they were still looking for the Messiah. Catch that. They were still looking for the Messiah. But not this one. Could that be relevant to us? 
we're looking for Jesus to come, but it may not be the Jesus that we would want, mm -hmm. rather than the Jesus that is. Mm -hmm. This Jesus, this Messiah, had flipped their ideas, their philosophy of what God is like on his head. I think, I think they could probably tolerate the parables, the preaching, the miracles, but so, but but to speak of his kingdom not being of this world? Most of us live a life that is of this world, don't we? Unfortunately. This humble, meek, but totally oblivious to fake news, Jesus. This good news Messiah, they didn't want to have anything to do with. For he even said, he even raised the bar saying that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, are you kidding me? They were the cream of the crop. And just at that point in history, the Pharisees were starting to accept more of the Greek influence, the Greek cultural influence upon their nation. The Sadducees had already sold out. You know, they didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in, they didn't believe in angels, whatever. But the Pharisees, they were beginning to drink some of that Kool-Aid as well because the Greek influence was that of uplifting himself. But it was actually, it was, it was permeating throughout the Roman influence as well. There's little question, as I've suggested, that Annas was the mastermind of this illegal, hastily convened trial. They've been planning it a long time, likely even before the Christ announcement. And let's just look there briefly in uh, Matthew 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26, the first couple of verses. <clears throat> this is several days before. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the, high, then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery. Trickery. Deception and kill him, but they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Did you catch that political calculation there? There's no conviction in these people's lives, it's all expediency, it's all about what is advantageous to me. And we must ask ourselves, Who is in control here? God or Satan? I contend that God's in that Satan's in control of the priest, but God's in control of the situation. That's a good thing for Dale Martin to be to, to remember. When things and circumstances are going south, rather than being subsumed by the circumstances, I hate Irma. We got Irma pretty good. And Irma or whatever. Just remember who's in control of the situation. Hallelujah. Yes, Satan is forced to conform to God's timetable. Which all could have known according to the 70-week seven, prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 and 27. 3, 27. Fighting against God is always the case when the traditions and plans of men displace the word of God. Why? We are still here. God's not waiting for another satellite or 14 million evangelists. He's waiting for people who will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Amen. Amen. Can't you just see and hear them planning? Oh, let's begin our meeting tonight. Verse 5. Let's begin our meeting tonight with prayer. Amen. With just a word. Let's ask Yahweh to bless our plan. Isn't that how we often do in meetings? I don't know. Just asking. Just asking. 
I didn't say it felt good, but I'm just asking. So we come to early Friday morning, the pre preparation day. We're told that Joseph and Arimathea and Nicodemus were not at this blue leg trial. They were uninvited. Because you see, it took a unanimous decision for a decision to, to be confirmed by the Sanhedrin. Two dissenters, and I believe they would have dissented. There's clear evidence they would have. The two dissenters would have blown the thing up so they weren't uninvited, you might say. Now, as part of our gospel understanding, we think about the route they took from when Jesus was captured down to Jerusalem for this fake trial. And it was a fake trial because it was illegal. They had to cross the little brook Kedron, the little creek that flowed from the temple courtyard down to the, to the Dead Sea. And the sheep would then, you know, at, that, at that point, I should say, after they crossed the Kedron, they would be seen looking at the sheep gate where, the, where Jesus walked through, just like the sacrifice, sacrifices being taken in to be slaughtered. Crossing the Kedron, you know what flowed in the Kedron besides ordinary water? Blood and water. Great symbolism, great imagery of how the sacrifice of Jesus took our sins all the way to the Dead Sea. What does he say? I'll cast your sins into the Dead Sea. And, see, and there's no outlet. Not like Galilee. Galilee had an outlet, had an inlet, had lots of inlets and outlets. There were no outlets at the Dead Sea. Now there's a great lesson there. Those who have been forgiven of sin and experienced repentance, why do we keep dragging up their sins? God doesn't. We still do. Just a thought. Just a thought. Yes, as the brother read in Sabbath school this morning from Selected Messages, and I need to get that reference. We must know him as a savior before we can know him as our pattern. So the good news of Christ our righteousness is as we as we would progress through this is increasingly contrasted with the compromising worldly fake news of the Sadducees with the legalistic fake news of the Pharisees. Just as in type, where the sacrifice was to be carefully examined by the priest, so Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin to be examined. So they examined the gospel. This should bring tears to your eyes. They examine the gospel and they don't like what they see. This has happened to us repeatedly. That's why we're still here. Examinations of the gospel, the real gospel of Christ our righteousness, usually get spun. Lots of examination, but we don't like what we see. And we're still here. Time doesn't allow me to plumb the depths of the just joke of the trial of the gospel, but I think it would be remiss. I would be remiss if I left out his appearance before Pilate. This is crucial. <clears throat> when the Jews could not succeed in their fake trial, their bootlegged trial, where did they go next? You reject the gospel? What's this? You reject the gospel, you begin a walk toward the state. <coughs> yep. Absolutely. You got it, you got it brother. I see that happening. Churches of all denominations walking toward the state. In some supporters, the other government is bigger than Jesus. That's precisely how the 1260-year church-state collusion developed through spiritual weakness and compromise, a rejection of the gospel. Amen. 
The lying fake news continues throughout the trial while Jesus stands strong for the truth. He refuses to accommodate their move toward the state. He says, my kingdom, remember he's already said this, my kingdom is not of this world. 